Masechet Baba Mesia Daf Chet. We begin with the statement by Rami Bar Chama. He's a fourth generation Babylonian Amora, a colleague and a brother in law of Rava. Um, he married Rav Chista's daughter, and then when Rami Bar Chama died, then Rava um, married um, the, the, the widow, also Rav Chista's daughter. Rami Bar Chama is known, is known for saying very sharp comments, and here we see something that he derives from our Mishnah that we probably would never have thought of ourselves. Uh, that there is a halacha that in order to acquire something, one of the ways you can acquire it is through hagbaha, uh, lifting it off the ground. However, in order to accomplish that, the entire item has to be lifted off the ground. You can't have half on the ground and half not. So if someone went to uh, pick up a garment that's on the ground, you would have to pick up the entire thing in order to acquire it. If some of it is still on the ground, he would not acquire it. So Rambam Bar Chama is applying that to the Aram Mishnah and wondering how can it be that let's say both of them pick it up at the same time, uh, then how would it be possible for them both to acquire it since each one is only picking up half of it? So Rambam Bar Chama learns a halacha from this. Amar Rambam Bar Chama zotomeret hamagbiya mesia lachavero kana chavero. It must be that. If I want to pick up something for you, then that works and you acquire it, right? I can go in the street and I can find um, uh, an item, a watch, and I say, you know what? My friend would really like this watch. I'm going to acquire, I'm going to pick it up, not for myself, but only on behalf of someone else. Well, then that would work. Um, how do we know? If you say that that cannot be done, um, then Then in our case, when one person picks it up and he's picking it up for himself, well, then the other half is on the floor. And the other guy who picks it up, well, he also is picking up only half and the other half is on the floor. And therefore, nobody would acquire it if indeed they came at the same time. If one came first and picked up the entire thing, fine, right? But we're, if we're assuming that they came at the same time and there's a possibility that the achloku is a true a verdict because they were both there at the same time, well, how would it work if they're both only picking it up for themselves? Then neither uh, would pick would would uh, acquire it because the other half they did not pick up. It's on the floor. Therefore, it must be that. These two guys run up to this garment and they're picking it up. They're picking it up at the same time. They're looking at each other and they know this halacha and they know that if I pick up half and you pick up half and we each acquire it only for ourselves and neither of us will get it and then that means someone else can come and just grab it and run and so therefore we make a uh, an agreement. It doesn't it could be a silent agreement. So since I know this halacha, so when I pick it up, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick it up not only on behalf of myself but also on your behalf. And you all do the same thing. You'll pick it up for yourself and on my behalf. And then just kind of like become become partners. Um, partners who pick it up, they can, in fact, um, uh, acquire it together because together they're picking up the entire thing. And that's how when we come, in, when we come into court, um, the Gemara is going to ask about this later, about which clause of the Mishnah is talking about. Because the Mishnah says when they come into court, each one's claiming it's all mine. So how could you say they claim it's all mine when uh, they, um, uh, uh, that, that means when they picked it up, they intended to acquire it only for themselves and not as Rami Bar Chama says here. So the Gemara will deal the, with which clause of the Mishnah we're talking about. <clears throat> but in any case, he's learning from the fact that there is a possibility that you can pick it up and both acquire it and split it evenly. It must be that one can acquire something on behalf of someone else. That's Rami Bar Chama. His brother-in-law, Amar Rava, uh, though he was not his brother-in-law in his lifetime, only after he died. So Rava says, no, le'olam e'malach, but they were both students of Rav Chista but, but during their lifetime. So he says, no, I don't agree with this conclusion. Uh, it could be as follows. I could tell you, argue that your halacha is not correct and someone, if I pick up something on someone else's behalf, that person doesn't get it. It's impossible. It's impossible for me to uh, make an active acquisition and only someone else get it. That would not work. But here, this Mishnah works because um, we say since. Since I am acquiring it for myself, 
Therefore, I can acquire for myself and for someone else. So in the case of that wallet, let's say I, I, I see uh, uh, that watch. All right, I go and I see the watch. I say, you know, this is a really nice, wa nice watch. I would like to have it. And you know what? My friend also, he would like it too. And so, you know what? I'm going to pick it up on behalf of both of us and they will share it. Um, so that works because as long as the act of acquisition that the guy picking it up does is at least partly for himself, then it's a valid acquisition. And since he's picking it up for himself, he can also have his friend in mind and the friend will also get it. And that's sufficient to explain our Mishnah. Because in our Mishnah, the, the same thing, they're both run up, they're both picking it up. They know that if they pick it up only for themselves, then neither of them will get it. And so they say, you know what, I'm going to pick it up for myself. And since I'm picking it up for myself, I can also have you in mind. And the other one does the same thing. And that's how when they pick it up together, uh, it's a valid acquisition. And then uh, later on, when they come into court and they uh, uh, and they, uh, they, they agree that they picked it up each for themselves and for the other person, then they both acquire it and they would split it evenly. Teda. And Rava adds an extra proof for his position. She'ilu amar veganav patur. I know this is true because after all the halacha is that if a sender sends a messenger and says to the messenger go and steal that item for me right go into that store and I want you to steal that uh, that jewel for me and so the messenger goes in and he picks up the jewel from the store on behalf of the sender so the sender is not liable because the sender does not acquire it um, that's because that's the halakha you cannot pick something up only on behalf of someone else it doesn't work so the guy that picked it up he, he picked it up and walked out so the messenger will be liable for uh, stealing uh, because he's the one doing the act and the sender doesn't matter if the messenger if the messenger says oh I didn't pick it up on my behalf I picked it up on that person's behalf doesn't work you cannot you cannot acquire something for someone else however if they're partners then it's liable. Let's say two people come and come and say, "Listen, you know what? Let's together uh, do do uh, uh, do some crime." And uh, you know what? We'll, we'll take turns. You go into this store and you get uh, um, and pick get that jewelry, and we'll share it. We'll have, we'll share the profits. Um, and then uh, I'll do I'll do the next one, or I'll do something else. I'll drive you there. Um, so the in that case. Both of them are liable, right? When they catch this thief, this thief and the thief says, well, you're right, you know, I, I did um, uh, uh, acquire this for myself, but I also had in mind when I acquired it that I would have half and my partner who was out in the car, that he would have a half also. In that case, both of them are liable. Why? Because of Rava's principle. Since he acquires it for himself, therefore the acquisition, active acquisition works also for someone else and they're both thieves. And that's what the Gemara explains, right? Is it's not because since he acquired it for himself, the other friend also gets it. So you see that Rava says, my rule is true and not yours, Rami Bar Chama. Only if you acquire for yourself, then you can acquire for someone else. But if you only acquire it for someone else and not for yourself, then the transaction is invalid. And Ava says, I have an, a further derivation from my own law, even though he said now that you said, even though Rava himself said it. But Rava did bring a proof, right? A couple of proofs. And so that's why you could say, right, and now you must agree because look at all my proofs. So now that we've established um, uh, that we say this principle of Migo, the Migo principle is, if I report, if I pick it up for myself, then um, we both get it. Then my, and, uh, uh, if I pick it up for myself and for my friend, since I pick it up for myself, I can also acquire it for my friend. Uh, then we have a following conclusion that let's say a deaf person who's not competent, uh, generally a deaf person is not competent to do transactions. Midr midoraita, midr abanan. The rabbi said, listen, if a deaf person goes and picks something up, midr abanan, we're going to give it to him because we don't want to, we don't want, we don't want it to lead to fights. Can you imagine a deaf person picks up a watch on the floor? Someone else says, oh, you're a deaf person. You can't acquire anything, grabs it from his hand. A deaf person has enough uh, competence to know that something was just taken from him. He's going to run after him. They're going to start fighting. So this is not a good situation. So Medirabhananda said, you know what? If a deaf person picks something up, he can acquire it for himself.
So, if we have a situation where uh, a deaf person and a competent person, hearing person, um, go and they pick up a garment together. Um, so, since the deaf person acquires it for himself, which he can do, right? Because he can acquire it for himself. Therefore, we apply the Migo principle also in that case, and he'll be able to pick it up for himself and for the competent person, right? What an interesting thing. Even though a deaf person really couldn't do uh, 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 transactions normally, but once we say he can do it for himself, you know what? Now, since we'll apply also that he can do it for someone else. Now we ask about Rava's statement. Now we understand that the Cheresh will have an acquisition for it. How so? Because um, he acquired his own half and the other half is the competent person who picked it up for himself and for the deaf person. So now the, the Cheresh has both parts. That's fine. He has his own part, which he's allowed to do. And the, um, and the, and the, and the competent person picked it up on both of their, for both of their sakes. So that will work. But how about the competent person? How will he acquire his part? After all, when the rabbi said that a deaf person can acquire something, midrabanan, they said that about the deaf person himself only. Uh, but the deaf person does not have the competence to pick it up for himself and for someone else. Right? The Gemara here, in other words, is expressing dissatisfaction with Rava's assumption that if the rabbi said that the, uh, a deaf person can pick it up for himself, then we're going to apply the migo also in that case. Who said? No, maybe a deaf person, the rabbi said he can acquire for himself so that uh, he won't cut it won't start fighting with people who try to take it away from him and they won't start fighting with him. That's why the rabbi said that. But that doesn't mean that he can acquire it for, for someone else. So therefore, you, uh, the, there's no way for the competent person to, have, to acquire the item because the competent person can acquire his own half but the deaf person cannot have in mind to pick it up on behalf of the competent person. And so therefore, in that direction, it won't work. So you know what? We're going to revise Rava's statement. In fact, we'll have the paradoxical situation that the deaf person does acquire it, but the competent person doesn't. Why? Because the deaf person can acquire it for himself. That's for sure. The rabbi said so. And the competent person, he can acquire, he can acquire it for himself and for, um, and for others. So that takes care of all the parts for the deaf person. But the deaf person, while he can acquire his own, he cannot acquire it on behalf of the competent person. And so therefore, the competent person doesn't get it and the deaf person does. Okay. So that's what, and now that's the revised Rava. But now we ask, Umay Migo. But Rava said, Migo, because we have this rule that since a person can acquire for himself, so too he can acquire it for someone else, he's building on that rule. But where, and where, how, what way are we building on that rule here? If you're saying that actually the competent person can't even get it. So the answer is, oh, it's a different Migo that we're talking about. Migo de Shene Chereshin Be'alma Kanu Hainame Kane. Since, let's say you had two deaf people who would go and acquire it, and so they're acquiring it together as partners. And they can do that because they're saying, well, let's join together and we'll pick up, uh, you pick up that half and I'll pick up this half of the garment and we'll do it together. And that works. So if that, if, if that case works where competent people, uh, deaf people can acquire it for each other, uh, then, then also in this case, um, a deaf person can acquire it for himself and the, competent person also will have it will be able to acquire for himself and certainly has in mind if deaf people can have each other in mind then a competent person also can have himself and the deaf person in mind although still the other way around may not work uh, deaf people can have each other in mind but not a uh, not, not a competent person so we ask about this hi my but this derivation doesn't make sense Hi, Adat Hadide Kamagbaile, Ihu Lakane, Lacharini Makne. Um right, the logic here is something wrong with it. Because even if you say that someone who picks up something can acquire it uh, on behalf of his friend, that's only if 
he is acquiring it on behalf of his friend. But here in this case, look at the uh, pikeach. He is acquiring it on behalf of himself, uh, uh, for, first and foremost, and yet he doesn't even get it. So can he possibly acquire it on behalf of his friend? In other words, there's a paradox built into this case because if you say that oh, the cheresh gets it, because he picks it up for himself and the competent person picks it up for himself and for the cheresh, so that works, the cheresh gets it. But the Bekeach doesn't. Wait a second. The Bekeach can only give it, pick it up on behalf of the cheresh because he also gets it. If you're going to say in your conclusion that the Bekeach, the competent person, doesn't acquire it at all, then if he doesn't acquire it, then the then, then the deaf person also will not acquire it. It's impossible. You can't have it both ways that the Cheresh gets it totally because he got his own part and the competent person picked it up on behalf of the Cheresh, but the competent person doesn't have anything at all himself. So this makes no sense. Rather, we're going to revise Rava's statement again and say as follows, since the competent person doesn't get it, the deaf person also doesn't get it, since the deaf person can only pick it up for himself and not for the competent person, therefore the competent person doesn't get it. And even if the competent person has in mind to take it for himself and for the deaf person, but he's not going to end up being able to acquire it himself because he can't, he's, not get, he's not picking up the whole thing. And therefore, since he doesn't acquire for himself, then the deaf person doesn't get it either, and now nobody gets it. All right. Um, I th- suspect here that uh, Rava meant what we said originally in his uh, in the statement that we will apply the migo that since the rabbis made a takana that a deaf person can apply it can can pick it up for himself. Therefore, he can also have in mind someone else and pick it up on behalf of that person, and then it would work, and both of them would get it. Um, it seems that that's what Rava had in, uh, um, meant originally. Um, however, it seems that the Gemara did not had a problem with that because, well, a deaf person doesn't really have competence, so how could he then ha- do something and have in mind for someone else? If he picks it up, fine, we'll... Um, the, like the betin will give it to him so that people don't go grab it from him. But to have enough uh, competence to actually have someone else in mind also so that that person, they didn't make a takana for the competent person, so now we're going to give it over to the competent person as well. And so um, then through a series of, of challenges, we end up making it the opposite that um, in this scenario, according to Rava, one, neither of them can acquire it. All right. Now, the key tema, my shna mishne chedeshin de alma, had tam takinu lehu rabanan de la tel de ansuye, ha chame maramar pikech la cane, ana ikne. And now, if you'll ask, how come two deaf people can acquire it for each other? But not if, if it's one deaf person and one uh, competent person, right? How does that make sense? If a, a, if a deaf person can only acquire for himself, then how, when there's two deaf people, how can they have them in mind themselves and the other person? And the answer to that is when the rabbis made a takana so that people won't come to fight, they said, um, uh, in, 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 in this case, it's okay. Uh, and they, they, they applied that also to when two deaf people pick, up, pick things up for each other because you want, you want deaf people to be partners. Sometimes they want, they're carrying a heavy thing and so they want to, they'll be able, or they want to split it. And so we're going to make the takana will apply to two deaf people that pick something up at the same time and have each other in mind. That is also part of the takana. But that takana does not extend, um, uh, uh, according to this explanation here of Rava, does not extend to a comp- to a deaf person acquiring it on behalf of a um, of a competent person. Why? Because they, the rabbi said, "Listen, it's not going to come to uh, to to fighting because the deaf person will say to himself." Even the competent person didn't acquire it, so certainly I cannot, I cannot acquire it, right? In this case, when you have a deaf person and a competent person both picking it up at the same time, the competent person does not get it because deaf person cannot have a competent person in mind. So if a deaf person doesn't get it, that doesn't acquire it, someone else grabs it from him, that's it. The other person can grab it. So a deaf person is not going to go also run after that guy and say, hey, you know, you stole my item. He sees the competent person say, sitting there and saying, well, uh, he got it. I, didn't, I did not acquire it. 
So the deaf person will not come to fight because he says, I'm not going to be any better than a competent person. And so since that won't, will not come to fighting, there was no need for the rabbis to make a takana in such a case. And so that's why we have this interesting, uh, I still end up in an interesting paradox that um, uh, two deaf people can have each other in mind and pick it up together because the rabbis say, you know what, we'll give it to all of you. But the rabbis only make a takana when it will come to fighting. And so that's only when everybody is deaf. But if uh, if one is deaf and one is not, then the rabbis will not make a takana, and the, uh, the the competent person cannot acquire it because the deaf person doesn't have him him in mind. And since he cannot acquire it for himself, the, the competent person also cannot have the deaf person in mind and pick it up on his behalf. And so neither of them get it. All right. Next um, uh, analysis. Going back to what we started with, Avrami Bar Chama, who derived from our Mishnah that one can uh, pick acquire something for someone else. Avrami Bar Chama went an extra step uh, beyond Rava. Rava only said only if you pick it up for yourself, then you can also acquire for someone else. Um, but Rav, Rami Bar Chama said. Even if potentially you could take it yourself, then you can also acquire for someone else, even if you don't have yourself in mind. So it's possible to um, pick something up and not, and not take any ownership yourself, but only on behalf of someone else. Okay, now this diuk that Rami Bar Chama said, he says he learns it from our Mishnah, but which part of our Mishnah? If it's from the very beginning of the Mishnah, there they walk into court and they say, it says they claim, um, this is all mine because I uh, picked up the entire thing. And the other one says, it's all mine. He's saying that because he's saying, I picked up the whole thing only for myself. So here it's clear that they had in mind to pick it up only for themselves, not on behalf of the other person. And so in such a case, no, now we don't know whose it is. And so we end up saying um, they, will, they will split it because we don't know who's right. Um, uh, but uh, in fact, it, uh, it, it should be, um, uh, and it could be that one of them picked it up entirely, and whoever picked it up entirely first will have gotten it, um, uh, and then someone else came and grabbed it, right? That's what we suspect happened, um, but we don't know which is which, so fine, we'll, we'll split it. But this is not talking, uh, certainly not talking about a case where they picked it up at the same time, saw each other, and decided, you know what? I'll pick it up on your behalf, and you picked it up on my behalf, and therefore we all picked it up together, and that's how they uh, both have it together. That's not the case. That's not the first case. Rather, maybe it's from the double language in the Resha. This is what we started with all the way on back on Dafbet. Why did why do they say Anime Satya? Another one says Anime Satya. And then it seems like another dialogue. This one says it's all mine, and this one says it's all mine. Why do I need to have two cases there, two, two sets of dialogue. So it must be from the extra uh, wording. Uh, that's how we learn uh, that this, this law, that someone who picks something up on behalf of his friend also acquires it. It's all for built into the, that first clause is talking in fact about two different cases. Uh, we reject this. But go back and Dafbet. We already established that the first line is talking about things that you find. Uh, they both found it. Uh, they claim that they found a lost item. And the second line, right, that uh, this one says it's all mine, that one says it's all mine, is when they both buy it. And they both claim, oh, I went to the store, I gave the guy money, and I bought it. And the other guy says, no, I, I went to the store, and I bought it first, and I, it's, it's mine. And so it's coming to teach us that. We already established, we already used that clause to teach us the a buying and selling case, so you cannot use it for this. Um, this answer is difficult because um, that answer was said by Raf Papa. There is uh, some, some say it was a kiddi with, uh, with nobody. But um, if it was Raf Papa, Raf Papa is a fifth generation Amora, uh, a student of Rava, in fact, after Rami Bar Chama. So Rami Bar Chama, he would not have known that Raf Papa had already said that. And, he, and anyway, he could disagree. So Rami Bar Chama could have uh, learned this La Halakha from the extra clause in the, the extra line in the first clause. Uh, but the Gemara itself uh, already has Raf Papa 
and says, oh, we like that answer, and so we, we don't want Rabbi Bar Chama to have to ruin that answer, and so we're going to look for something else. Ela mi sefa, ze omer kol hasheli veze omer hasya sheli, aha tu lamali, ela mishnah yitara shema amina. Maybe it's from the second case in the Mishnah, where one claims that the entire thing is mine, and the other comes in claims, no, I only half of it is mine, and then they split it one quarter, three quarters. Now, why do I need this case? It's basically the same principle, right? We just, whatever you're agreeing to, we give to one, to one half, uh, that one half to the person who says, all mine, and then we apply the same principle to the other half. What else am I learning here that I wouldn't, that I didn't know before? So, this is from this extra uh, teaching, is, teach, uh, is to teach us that Ami Bar Chama's law, that So we'll learn it from the second clause. But then we ask, How do you know that second clause is talking about finding an item? Maybe that's also talking about buying and selling, right? If you already established that Kula Sheli, Kula Sheli is buying and selling, then maybe the Kula Sheli, Chesya Sheli, um, same, same type of language, is also a case of buying and selling, not picking things up. See, in the case of buying and selling, you don't have this problem of who had, you picked it up at the same time. Because if you go into a store, right, and you pay for it, pay for the, the pay for the thing, and then you and then you and then you take it out with you, uh, so then it's yours. Um, just by uh, by uh, taking by uh, uh, taking it out, picking it up and taking it out of the store. Um, so it's not like it's in the middle of the street that you have to pick up the whole thing. Okay. Now you'll ask, well, if it is talking about buying the item, then what is what do we need it for? We already have in the first clause, it told it told us that this halakha of splitting it applies to a bought item. So why do I need another case about a bought item? No, I do need it because uh, I would have thought because I might have thought that the one who said it's only half mine, he's like returning a lost item. Look, he could, if he was lying, he could say the whole thing is mine and then, and get, and then get half. Instead, he's curtailing his own claim, saying he only has, uh, he only uh, owns a half, and so is he's like basically returning the lost item uh, of the other half willingly. So therefore, I might think that he should not have to make a vow. Um, so the Mishnah, this clause teaches us that no, we would we'd be afraid that he would use trickery and he would say, oh, you know what? Uh, if I say he is, I'll say he's a liar. If I say the whole thing is mine, I'm going to have to make a vow. You know what? I don't want to make a false vow. That's really bad. I don't mind stealing, but I don't want to make a false vow. So you know what? I'll say half is mine. That way I can just get a quarter and without having to make a vow. A person would rather steal a quarter without a vow than steal a half with a vow. And so since we know that this is a psychology of a thief, uh, so uh, then if we allowed him not to take a vow, because since he's being so generous to return an item, to return half of it, um, then they would uh, take advantage of that and then steal without a vow. That's why, that's why, as the Mishnah teaches us, we have to make a, he has to take a vow, even in this case. So with this clause is used up, it's not extra. Rather, it must be from the third clause, the third case, when two people are riding on an animal, or one of them is riding and one of them is leading it. Um, why do I need this case? It's the same principle, right? There's two people that have a valid acquisition on an item, and uh, they're, both, uh, they're, they're, they're both holding on to it, or both riding it, so we split it. This is the same principle as before. So this is an extra clause, and this is where we where we learn that if I pick up something on behalf of my friend, then my friend gets it. There's a difficulty here that we're learning the law about picking up on behalf of a friend from a case that doesn't involve picking something up, right? It would be much better to learn this from a case of a garment where the two people are picking it up. Oh, I'm picking it up for you. You're picking it up for me. That's how it works. But in this case, they're not picking up the horse at all. So you have to answer that, 
Oh, we're applying the same idea that if I ride the animal, it just doesn't really work so well because if I ride the animal myself, it's mine. So now it's a problem because uh, I jumped on the animal to ride on it at the same time that someone else also jumped on the animal to ride on it. Okay, so then we split it. All right, so somehow we have to learn from the fact that it's extra, um, right? It's extra. I don't need it at all. So this is coming to teach, you know what? You could have learned the thing that you learned in the first one from here. And so from the first one, you'll learn that if I pick it up for you, you pick it up for me. Okay, you see that we're getting into difficulty. Uh, but anyway, we're going to reject this. Maybe we're, uh, we're learning from the third clause that someone who sits on an animal, even though if they're not going anywhere, um, he acquires it. That's, that's, we're learning about the acquis- laws of acquisition of animals. Maybe that's why we need the third clause. You know what? It's not extra. Okay. From the very last line of the Mishnah that says, if they agree, if they admit to each other and agree, you know what, we got there at the same time. Or if there are witnesses um, that say that that they both were there, got there at the same time and picked it up together, then they split and they don't have to make a vow. Now, what case is this talking about? If we're talking about buying and selling, would you have to say it? Okay, they agree. They agree that, you know, we bought this together, we'll split it. Well, then, obviously, they can they can do so. No, that would be obvious. So, therefore, must be talking about a case where they found it on the floor. And, where, and the chidush is that, even though each one picked up only half, and therefore, neither did a full act of acquisition, because neither picked up the entire thing nevertheless they do get it together no one else can 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 get it uh take it from them um because each one can have in mind you know what i'm going to pick it up not only for myself but also for you and the other guy says the same thing and therefore they pick it up as partners and that's why they split it and it is a good acquisition that's where we're learning it from. And Ava agrees that we learn it, we can learn it from that last clause. And he's just uh, attenuating the lesson that we learned. This doesn't necessarily mean that if I pick it up only for you and not for myself, then you would get it. No, I disagree with that rule. Here it works because I'm picking it up for myself also. Then I can have you in mind and we can both do it. And you also do the same. You're picking it up also for yourself and having me in mind so as long as you're picking you're you're acquiring it for yourself then yes you can pick it up on behalf of someone else as well and share it we next analyze the case in the mishnah about one person riding the animal and the other person leading it and they come into court and also they split it in that case so rav yosef quotes Rav Yehuda teaching Shema'it mine de mor Shemuel tarte that Rav Yehuda heard two laws from Shemuel. So we have a, a triple chain here. Rav Yosef is quoting Rav Yehuda, quoting Shemuel. Uh, the first, right, Shemuel's first generation, Rav Yehuda's second generation, Rav Yosef is third generation. And Shemuel said two things, Rachuv manhig chad kane vechad la kane velayadane he minayhu. He said that riding an animal and leading an animal, one in one of those cases that can make an acquisition, and one of those actions does not make an acquisition. But I don't know which one is which. I don't remember, Rav Yehuda says, I don't remember which one Shemuel said. Now we ask, Hechidame, what case are we talking about? Are we talking about separate cases of someone riding an animal and trying to acquire it? And another case of someone leading an animal, trying to acquire it? Um, and uh, we're not sure which one is a, a valid form of acquisition. Um, let's say, you know, you see um, a, a lost, a, a, a abandoned animal, Hefked, and you want to go and take it. Now, leading an animal, is there anybody that would disagree and say that's not a form of acquisition? That's a classic thing. You take an animal and you and you pull it and lead it. So then that for sure that is. No one would argue about that. But if anything that might have a question, it would be riding an animal. Uh, just sitting on it, not moving, just sitting on an animal, that, that maybe that would be, that's not necessarily 
in the form of acquisition. So then why, why do you have a question? Because it would be clear if you're not sure which one he said is and which one is not, clearly leading would be a good acquisition and sitting on an animal would not be a good acquisition. So then Rav Yuda would not have a, a question about what Shemuel said about that. So that cannot be the case. Rather, we're talking about two people who are trying to acquire a, um, a found animal together, one of them sitting on it and one of them leading on it. My, which one takes precedence? Is the one sitting on it. Maybe he's better because he's actually grasping the animal itself. His, his legs are around the animal. He's holding the animal. So maybe he takes precedence or do you say the person leading the animal? That's a classic way of acquiring and he's pulling it and the animal's following him and it's walking because of him and maybe that is better and that's what Rav Yehuda, that's the case that Shema was t- teaching and I don't know if he said this one is better or that one is better Amar Rav Yosef Amar li Rav Yehuda Nechze Anan so Rav Yosef uh, then continued and quoted Rav, Rav Yehuda further saying you know what let's try to figure it out ourselves I don't know what Rav Yehuda says but we can reconstruct his argument. Ditnan. Hamanhig sofeg et arbaim. Vayosheb bakaron sofeg et arbaim. Rebi meir poter et ayosheb bakaron. If one person uh, we're talking about kilayim. You have two uh, different, uh, a horse and a donkey that are harnessed to a one wagon and they're both pulling it. This is a prohibition of working two different species of animals together. Who violates? Um, one person is leading the animals, so he gets lasses. That's for sure, because leading the animals, that's causing them to move. But what about the person sitting in the wagon? Um, Tanakama says the person sitting in the, sitting in the wagon also gets lashes. He's riding. Where right now we're saying sitting in the wagon is similar to riding, and so he gets lashes. That would mean that sitting in the wagon slash riding is a form of uh, working the animals, and therefore is also re- liable here, and therefore also would be a form of acquisition. However, the Bimeir says no. Only the one leading the animal gets lashes for violating kilayim. The one sitting in the wagon, he's just sitting there. He's not doing anything, and therefore, according to Bimeir, it would sound like riding an animal would not be a form of acquisition, um, at least and not when someone else is leading it. Now, Umidapich Shemuel Betanes. Shemuel himself had a different version of this Mishnah, and he switched the two opinions. Um, and he says, Since he switched them, and according to Chachamim, and Halacha will follow Chachamim, say that the one sitting in the wagon does not get lashes, that means that sitting in the wagon is not considered leading the animal, is not considered acquiring the animal and working it and so um, uh, that we can conclude that according to Shemuel even riding an animal sitting on an animal by itself without anybody else doing anything is not an acquisition and all the more so if one person is sitting on the animal and the other person is leading the on uh, leading the animal then leading the animal would would be or would acquire it and the person sitting on the animal would not acquire it and so even though we you uh, Rav Yudad did not remember uh, what Shemuel said exactly he was able to quote this Mishnah in Kilayim and uh, figure out and Shemuel switched the opinions and thereby figure out that what Shemuel was trying to say is leading an animal acquires and sitting on an animal does not acquire. Yosef. Now, um, Rav Yosef is teaching all this and uh, to his student, Abaye, right? So now we're going yet a fourth generation. And he said, He says, many times you taught us this very proof and you used this language. Let, let us see as if, and it sounded like you were coming, you came up with, the, with this proof and that you were quoting, um, but you didn't say that you were repeating something that Rav Yehuda said. See, Rav Yosef, uh, when he got older, he forgot some of his learning, and so Abaye is trying to jog his memory. He says, you know, did you leave something out? 
of this teaching. Amale Ibra, and then Rav Yosef says, "You're right. In fact, you, I I did hear this from Rav Yosef. I said it now in the name of uh, in, in the name of Rav Yehuda. Now I said Rav Yehuda, and before also when I said it earlier, it was also in the name of Rav Yehuda, even though I forgot about that. So thank you for reminding me. Ud Charan Ud Charnan Name Da Amarele. And now that you're jogging my memory, I also remember something else. Um, that." Uh, we had, uh, I asked him a question, uh, Rav Yosef, asked Rav Yehuda a question. Hechi pashit mor rachub me Yosheb. Yosheb la tafis be mosera. Rachub tofes be mosera. He asked him, how can you compare sitting on an animal from sitting in a wagon? If you're sitting in the wagon, you're not holding on to the reins, whereas a person sitting on the animal is uh, holding on to the reins. So maybe sitting in the wagon is considered nothing, doesn't violate kilayim, and does not uh, acquire uh, acquire anything. But maybe sitting on the animal, maybe that would be an acquisition. And Rav Yudah answered me and said, uh, no, I have a tradition from Rav and Shemuel. Rav Yudah studied from both of these masters. Um, and they said that um, a, a, a Moserah holding a reins is not a form of acquisition. Not unless you're pulling on the reins and making the animal go. Certainly, if you make the animal go, that would be, but just holding the reins by itself, that is not sufficient. And therefore, in fact, sit, whether you're holding the reins or not, doesn't matter. And therefore, if they're sitting in the wagon is not a, an acquisition, so too, sitting on the animal is not an acquisition. This last conversation is another version of it that leads to the same thing. Um, in this version, how can you figure out, how can you derive sitting on an animal from sitting in the wagon. Um, in this version, it sounds like Rav Yosef himself presented the proof, and so Abaya is asking Rav Yosef, how did you derive one from, from the other? Aren't they different? Yosef, la tafis rachub, tafis because the one sitting in the wagon is not holding the reins, but the one riding the animal is holding the reins. And his answer was not in the name of Rav Shemuel, but rather a Braita that Idi taught, and he said that holding the reins, holding reins just by itself, uh, not pulling on, not using them, is not a form of acquisition, and therefore it isn't in fact, the same thing sitting in the wagon, just like a guy sitting in the wagon does not violate kilayim, so too he does not acquire, and that's the same as a guy sitting on an animal does not acquire, and uh, that we understand what Shemuel originally taught. We have another statement that supports this idea that reins, holding reins by themselves, is not an acquisition because Rav Huna said that if someone is holding the reins, if he received it from his friend, then that's a form of acquisition. But just if you found a lost uh, uh, animal and held on to the reins, or if a convert died without any heirs, and so now it's hefked, and one and and anyone who takes it first gets it. If you just hold on to the reins, that's not sufficient. Uh, so this is a uh, important distinction that reins will work as long as someone else has in mind to give it over to you, the original owner. And that's, in fact, built into the word. My Lashon Mosera, why are reins called Mosera, like Limsor, to transfer over to someone else? Amar Ava'idi Azberali, Ki Adam HaMoser Davar Lechavero, Bishlam Mechavero Kane, Te Kamasar Le Chavre, Ela B'Mesia B'Nechse Hager, Man Kamasar Le De Likne. And so Rava says, Idi explained this to me, right? We also had Idi up here. And he said um, that it means uh, like someone who is passing something to someone else. Um, this is an important verb because in the beginning of Pirkei Avot, when it says, Misara Yoshua Yoshua Misara, right? Yoshua Lezikanim. The word Limsod is actually a legal transfer. Um, it's not simply that um, uh, Yoshua, you know, gave a copy of the Torah to the Zikanim. He legally transferred it to them to say, you have authority now to um, explain and interpret, and uh, you're in charge of uh, of the of the law now, right? It's under your uh, authority. Uh, it's your responsibility. Uh, that's a chidush of Chacham Fa'ur. Okay, important uh, word. So Moser has to have a giver and a receiver. So that's the what the language, that's what the word means. So if one is acquiring an animal from his friend and the friend is giving it over to him, um, uh, uh, then it makes sense that the person receives 
receiving it as long as you just hold on to the reins, even without pulling the animal, that works, right? Because there's a giver and a receiver. But if there's no giver, if you're just finding a lost item or something that was hefked because a convert died, well, then who's giving it over? You can't, you can't use a mosera, an item that is used to transfer from one person to another, um, has to have a giver. And if there's no giver, then the reins by themselves do not make an, form an acquisition. Now we ask about Rabbi Huda's law that riding does not, sitting does not make an acquisition. A question from our Mishnah. Um, that our Mishnah teaches that if one per, two people are riding or if one person is riding and one person is sitting, and then they split it. So that, that means in our Mishnah, sitting on an animal sounds like it does form, it is an acquisition. Now, who is the author of our Mishnah? If it's Rabbi Meir, well, um, Rabbi Meir said, this is according to Shmuel's version of that other Mishnah, that switched the order. Um, and so according to the Bimeir, um, in, uh, in, in, this, in this version, uh, sitting on an animal acquires it. So all the more so, uh, um, uh, sitting in a wagon, right, acquires it, because that's what Abim Meir said, that he get the guy sitting in the wagon gets 40 lashes, and so if sitting in the wagon is, an, is a form of acquisition, then sitting on the animal, all the more so, you're actually directly on the animal. So then uh, Abim Meir would not have to say this, it would be obvious, this Mishnah would be obvious that the one uh, writing um, would acquire it, and so that would be too simple for the Mishnah to teach. Ela lav rabanan, ushmami Rather, it must be that this Mishnah is the opinion of Rabbanan, who said, yeah, regarding the wagon over there, uh, he doesn't get uh, uh, lashes, but here, riding, riding the, uh, sitting on the animal does acquire it, and then he, can, he gets half of it. Um, even though someone else is was leading the animal, so this is a challenge to what we learned. We just learned from from Rav Yehuda. Oh, we answer. No, our Mishnah is talking about a person who is leading it with his with his feet, uh, with his legs, and he's not just sitting on the animal. He's actually uh, kicking the animal to make it go, um, and uh, that's why he acquires it. It's just sitting on an animal, like sitting in a wagon, would not would not be any acquisition, um, but making it go. That's the key, and that's what he's doing here. Wait a second. If he's sitting on the animal and making it go, then that's the same as the person leading it. That's just the same thing. And we answer, you're right. Today, Gavne Manhig, right? There's two, there's two types, two ways to lead an animal. The point is that if you're making the animal move, then you acquire it. But so why is it? Why does it have to teach this? Uh, uh, and why does it have to teach it in two different ways? Two different ways of making it go. Because I might have thought that the person riding the animal making it go, he would take precedence and get the animal all for himself because he is not only leading it, making it go, but he's also actually holding on to the, he was actually um, also uh, uh, on the animal um, and because uh, uh, he's, he's, he's holding it with his legs. And so maybe that would be take precedence over the person who's only leading the animal by its reins. Um, and so therefore, Kamash Malan, it teaches that, it teaches me that they're both the same. The person riding the animal and the person leading it by his reins, they all both have equal, it's an equal acquisition, equal claim, and that's why they split it. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.